All right, let's get started. All right, let me make sure I got everybody muted here. Hold on one second. All right, first of all, thanks to everyone for making time to stop by Real Talk today. Real Talk, where we spell the word real in all capital letters, just so you know we mean business. Um, and before we get going, let's uh, just do a quick housekeeping. Uh, there is a mute button on your bottom left, so wanna keep yourself muted during the call so we don't get feedback. Uh, also, if you wanna ask a question, let me introduce you to Lauren Lee. Lauren, can you say hi? Hi, everyone. Lauren Lee is our amazing administrative assistant and she'll be monitoring the chat today. So if you have questions, you can direct them directly to Lauren Lee or you can just send them out to everyone. She's gonna be checking on everything uh, and make sure if anyone has questions, they get answered. Uh, the call is being recorded. So I've always said, if you have any outstanding warrants, you may wanna lay low on the call. Uh, and let's get going. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Richard Wilkinson. I'm a real estate agent with Compass here in Los Angeles. I am also the lead agent and CEO of the Wilkinson Properties Group. Uh, and most importantly today, our call today is sponsored by my wife, Jennifer. My wife, Jennifer, she does everything for everyone all the time. No appreciation necessary. But seriously, I wanna say thank you to my wife, Jennifer, who's been my amazing partner for the last 20 years and I couldn't do anything I'd do without her. Um, okay, today our guest is Steve Scholl. Steve is a former NFL football player. He played linebacker for the Miami Dolphins. Uh, Steve played in Super Bowl 17 and was the special teams captain during that Super Bowl. He had a successful career on Wall Street. And in the last 24 years, Steve has been one of the top real estate consultants and coaches in the country. I think if you ask Steve what is one of his greatest accomplishments, one of his greatest joys in life, I think Steve- Coaching, coaching you, that would be it, right? Coaching me, exactly. Um, and so today, uh, Steve is on the call today. He's, he's not even going to talk about himself. He wants, said he wants to talk to me. And my question for you, Steve, is, is, is am I in trouble? You are not in trouble, but you are on camera. So let's go. All right. What you got? So before we even begin, thanks, everyone. Welcome today. Richard, why don't you give everyone just a, a brief update on what is going on in the market during these challenging times with the coronavirus yeah um well that's that's obviously a, a great question uh you know i think things are there, there's some hesitation out there obviously uh you know we had some listings that were on the market that they paused for a moment uh but we have lots of listings on the sideline that are going to be coming to the market um there i think there's a lot of pent-up demand out there houses are still selling uh there's still multiple offers on houses out there um, I think that, you know, if, if you are a seller, you probably want to be active now uh, before there is any sort of adjustment in pricing. Um, I think if you're a buyer, now's a good time to be a buyer as well because you, your competition is a bit less. Uh, so you can get out there and, uh, and make some things happen with less competition. The, you know, the previous decade has been, you know, uh, blood in the streets if you're a buyer. So, uh, you know, having a little breathing room uh, is nice now and you know we our, our team has developed you know uh, processes to keep everyone safe and uh, you know how to manage things virtually uh, as best we can so uh, I, I think that what typically is the spring selling season is going to become the the summer selling season so I think it's going to be a crazy busy summer out there in the world of real estate in Los Angeles. So are, are people calling you right now or people wanting to know what they can and can't do do they have an interest in the market or is everything just on a big pause no there's yeah i, I have conversations you know I, I still work every day like i normally work before shelter in place you know I, instead of going to my office i go to our, our guest house in the back and i do my normal day um and most of my normal day is is, is communicating with people um, and uh, I have lots of conversations with people, you know, preparing, getting pre-approvals if they're buyers to get ready to go in the market. Um, you know, communicating that message of how, you know, people want to see a house. This is how we do it. You know, people who are pre preparing their listings, you know, walking them through our virtual plan. So yeah, people are still active and still, you know, wanting to know what, what's going on and we're communicating that to them so they can be successful. 
And what's been the biggest change for you during the last six or seven weeks outside of obviously working at home? Um, being around my children 24 seven, that's the biggest change. It's like, you know, they don't, when you get married, you think like, this is great. We're going to get married. And, and then you, there's a buffer. Like, so you see, you see each other maybe two or three hours a day with, with the exception of me. I work with my wife, but like there's these built in buffers that you're unaware of. And then all of a sudden the buffers have gone away and it's like, we're together all the time. And so um, that's been a- amazing to be able to work and then see my kids go out and run around the yard and then walk out and like play with them for a little while and then go back and go to work. Like th- that's like priceless, you know, but at the same time, they're all, you know, this is, this, this has an effect on everyone, you know, in some way, like, you know, we're, we're social creatures, you know, we want to be out, we want to engage with people, you know, and, um, you know, they're processing it their own way. And so, you know, there's, there's meltdowns here and there that you have to field and, uh, you know, and, and keep yourself in check. So, um, yeah, I think that that's been the biggest change. I think, well, I think also on the business side of it, it's, you know, you, most of what I do when I'm not in the office is, is, is interfacing with people, you know, human contact and conversation and sitting in people's living rooms and showing houses and being in cars with people. And, you know, all that is, is different now, you know, like we, we closed a transaction yesterday and I show up, I got a mask on and gloves, like, a, you know, I'm six, three with a beard and a shaved head. And I got a, I look like a serial killer. And I come out and like, we, we elbow bump from a distance and exchange keys. And it's just a little, you know, it's just different now. And what do you anticipate will be the, the imprint of all this once we get to the other side? I mean, my, I think that ultimately, once, once we get to the other side of it, hopefully we can, as a, as a, as a human race, retain the, the good stuff that's come out of it. You know, the fact that we are all like implicitly connected, you know, we, there's no, there's nothing that we do that doesn't impact each other, you know, and um, and then some of the things of like the family connectedness, the, you know, the, the taking the time to pause, you know, I think we were all, you know, as Americans, we run real hard all the time. And I think in my profession, you know, I run and my team runs real hard all the time, you know, and I think there, I think there is a cost associated with that. And I think uh, having to pause, a forced pause and look around at the way we've been doing things and the new way we could do things um, is great. And I, and I feel like I've been, a, it's weird, like I can't go out and see people, but I feel like I've been really connected with a lot of people. A lot of people I haven't really been connected with in a long time. I think it's been quite nice, you know, outside of obviously all the, the, the trauma and death in the world. Uh, it's been, uh, there's been some silver linings. All right, what we want to do today is give all of you a behind the scenes look at the life of a real estate agent. And Richard's one of the most interesting characters in the world of real estate. And so, Richard, why don't we start off? You know, how in the heck did you end up selling real estate? Uh, when, I, when I was a child, like in, in, in kindergarten, they went around the room and people were like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a superhero. I want to be a ninja. And they got to me and I'm like, I want to be a realtor. Uh, no, I, um, I had, um, you know, I, I, I was, I grew up in rural Louisiana in the middle of nowhere, you know, in places that you would drive by on the interstate, never know anybody lived back there. And um, I, I, I think as I got older, you know, I was looking around, unconsciously sort of looking around, like, what am I going to do as I started to get out of high school? And, you know, there wasn't like a lot of, there wasn't, there wasn't like a life that I saw that looked like a life that I fit in, you know? Um, I tried different things. And, uh, and so I just, I went to college and I was going to be a, a, I had started out, I was going to be an x-ray technician. 
because I met a guy one night who was older than me and he was an x-ray tech and he, he, he seemed like he was nice and he had a nice car. And I was like, I'll do that, you know? <laughs> and so I started college and that was my major. And then when I was there, uh, there was a play that was happening in college. And so um, I went and I auditioned for the play and I just felt like that was something I could probably do. And, uh, and I got the part and uh, it was a really great experience. And then I, after the, the guy who was the, the head of the department came up and said, hey, look, we have, um, we have scholarships that we give out to people. Um, you know, we have a few of them and I, I you know, I'd like, I, I think you're really, I think you're good and I'd like to give you one. And I was like, okay. And so all of a sudden I had a scholarship to go to college and uh, a, a theater scholarship. And then I, I transferred to another school uh, and I got another scholarship there. And so I, I, all my school got paid for through doing that. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go be an actor, you know? And so when I finished school, I was like, go to either, I'm either going to go to Los Angeles or New York. And so uh, I decided to go to New York because I thought it'd be an interesting place to be. Um, got to work there, you know, and, and I, I started working and I got a job. My first film that I ever did there it was like an independent film. Um, uh, it had, a, it was a young couple that was doing it. And it had a $2 million budget and I had never known anyone that had $2 million and they seemed really young. And so one day on the set, a guy was putting a microphone on me and I, I leaned in and I said, Hey, how do these guys have all this money? And he's like, Oh, they own a bunch of real estate. And I was like, Oh, and I just sort of tucked it in the back of my mind. I'm like, Oh, maybe someday I'll buy a bunch of real estate. You know, I'll be a big successful actor. I'll buy a bunch of real estate. Fast forward, you know, 10 years later and uh, I'm in Los Angeles now and I'm a little burnout on, on that profession and I need something else to do. And I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll you know what I'll do. I'll become a real estate agent. Um, I think LA is a real estate Mecca. It seems super easy. Like you just kind of show somebody three houses, they point at one and they give you a check, you know? Uh, and then I, I got a license and quickly learned out like that was not how it worked at all. And, uh, I happened to get my license in 2007. Uh, which is a, a horrible, wonderful time to get a real estate license because it was literally at the time of the global economic collapse. And uh, I always said, like, I, I was walking out of the building with my license. I'm like, hey, where's everyone going? There was like running the other way. And uh, I had a pregnant wife and uh, with the first baby. And um, I just dug in and I started learning. And I, I joined this little brokerage and like all the other agents left. So it was just me. And I would just show up every day and I would just listen to the broker. I was just bombarding with questions. I was like, how does that work? What does that mean? Da, 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 da. Like all the time, just asking, asking, asking. He's like, this is what you do. And I was like, great. And um, <clears throat> he taught me how to sort of like build a business. And then I, when, I, when I started to really dive into it, there were all these correlations between my previous life, that things I loved about my previous life and real estate. You know, it's super personal. Uh, it's emotional. Uh, there's an intensity to it. Uh, there's a process with it, you know, like when you, when you make a film or you do a play, there's a process and you end up with a result, you know, something substantial. And um, this was even better because like you end up and there's a thing that's happened. You know, you've, you've helped people buy a home or you've helped them sell a home or make an investment. And um, it was really, uh, really satisfying. And, um, and that's when it really took off for me. Once I, once I made that connection and, um, realized I think what I really always wanted, because my parents moved my whole life, my parents probably moved like 35 times and I was with them for a lot of that. And so I was always the new kid, like trying to figure out like, hey, well, how do these kids dress and what do they sound like? And, you know, oh, well, because if, if I can look and sound like them, then they'll, they won't know I'm not new. They won't know I'm not one of them and they'll just accept me, you know? Um, and so I was always looking for like community and, um, I realized like, oh, I'll be a successful actor and everyone will know me and then I'll never be the new kid again. I'll be accepted, you know? And so I found this actually in real estate. You know, I've done so many transactions over the last decade that it's hard for me to go anywhere where I don't see a client or I don't see someone who knows my client and have, have created this awesome network of really wonderful people that I've done are been, been lucky to be a part of really meaningful things in their lives. And so by default, I've found this thing I've always looked for in real estate, which is connection and community and being able to help people. And, you know, that's how it's a long winded way of how I got into real estate. Yes, it is. <laughs> so from the outside looking in, real estate looks easy. 
right? Super easy. You find nice homes, put people in your car, you show them the home, they write up an offer, they get buy it, you get a big paycheck, yes. and boom. Do it again. <laughs> What's the reality of being a real estate agent? It's... For, it, it, for me, it's, you know, it's supposed to sort of look that way for my clients. You know what I mean? Like, it, it seems like, you know, and I used to not really, now when I meet people and I'm working with them, I'll say, look, you know, from the outside, it's going to look really easy. But behind the scenes, like, I'm doing all these different things to make it look easy so it's easy for you. You know, my, I want to create simplicity for the clients I work with. But there's... There's so many things happening on so many different levels all the time. Um, and, and having to switch, like, I, I think one of the things that I'm, I'm fortunate with with my, with my background is that I can really sort of feel where people are and I can, I, can, I can sort of switch my communication to match their communication, which helps me get further along when I'm dealing with other agents, lenders, service providers, escrow, any anybody like I'm managing I always say I'm the quarterback you know like I'm, I have to make sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing and and that's that's not easy to do it's uh, it requires a lot of skill what is the thing you love most about real estate I love most about real estate it's just it's it's being a part of that process with people. Cause many times you sit down with people, whether they're buying a house or selling a house. And, and there's a, there's a strange sort of phenomenon. Like everyone lives in some kind of structure, you know, you live in a home, like you rent a home or you live in an apartment or something, you, you live someplace. And so you have the internet. And so you have all the kind of like ideas of how it all works. And so you sit down with people and a lot of times it's, it's, um, it's helping them process through that and going, hey, let's, okay, give it all to me, what you, how you think it works, and then I'm going to explain to you how, how I'm going to simplify it, you know? And so the, 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 the act of being able to simplify that process for people, bring them clarity and get them to the other side of it in a way that's like got humor in it and levity. Um, I love doing that. I love being the guy who can help, who can figure it out. You know, you're, you have a problem. I can figure it out, you know? There's an old saying, you're not in a real estate transaction when there's a problem. There's big problems or small problems. There's always problems, you know? And I, I just, I, I, I love having worked so hard to learn so much to be able to make things easy for people in a, in, in a tr process that is very, can be very anxiety producing for them. So you get that phone call that you love. Hi, Richard. We're thinking about selling our home. Would you come over and talk to us? And you set the appointment. You go over to someone's house who's thinking about selling their home. What kind of work are you doing before you get to the appointment? And what are you thinking about once you're sitting in someone's living room? Um. I, I'm doing a lot of, you know, we, we obviously we have our materials, we're getting together, our listing presentation, you know, all the standard stuff that we have that we've created, you know, we have in, in our business, you have to have systems, you know, you, systems have to be in place and always have to be being refined. But I'm, I'm looking holistically at the market, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, when they bought, what do they buy for what may be their situation trying to get as much information as I can trying to see where things are moving. Um, you know, a lot of times agents will look at like, you know, look at the sold comps. What's sold? What's sold in the last 90 days? Same zip code, closest in proximity, which is, you know, how an appraiser would appraise a home. Um, you know, I'm looking at like what's pending, uh, what's, what's under contract, what's coming to the market. And I'm calling all these different people trying to figure out where they are in their transactions so I can, I can see where the market's moving. Like I, I always use an analogy of like, you know, sold comparable properties are like waves crashing on the beach. They crash on the beach, they roll up the beach for 90 days, and then they disappear into the sea, never to be seen again. So we want to see what waves are coming behind it. And so when I sit down with people, I'm trying to give them the best holistic view of the market 
uh, a given range of value and where their property could fall in that range of value and then how we could impact them moving up that range of value. And then once I get in the house, um, when talking to people, I'm really listening, being present with them, seeing where they are, what's going on, how I, how I can help, where can I help. So typically the, the big question any seller has is what is my home worth? Right. And oftentimes the seller are going to they're gonna think their home's worth more than where, where the market is. Yeah. So what, what would you say to someone who's thinking about selling their home? What's the best way to have a pricing conversation with their real estate agent? Well, I think it is a very, that, that is where, that is probably the most complicated part of, of when you're sitting down to talk to someone. Because like, you know, you're going through marketing, you're showing all the things you're going to do, but then it gets to price. And, and I would say nine times out of 10, a seller believes their home is worth more than what it actually is, you know? And so I think, as I always tell people, like I, it's, it's their asset, it's their home. You know, like I can't make them do anything, you know, like I'm going to be always candid and forthright and honest with my opinions. And that's what we talk about. I say, look, I disagree with the value based on X, Y, and Z, you know, um, but it's your house, you know, like how do you want to handle it? And the reason we're having this conversation now is because if it's not moving, you know, we know what some of the things, the problems may be, and we can make quick decisions to make sure we get it taken care of. I'm never going to sit down with someone and just go, okay, you know, and get the, the listing and then blindside them with information that I knew, you know, that I had, you know, feelings about prior to. It's, it's really, a, it's a conversation. It's a dialogue, you know. Uh, I'm a consultant and uh, I, I, I want to have clear, honest communication with them about value. And, and what would you say to a potential seller in terms of the, there will be agents who come in and will tell that seller whatever they want to hear in terms of price or even promise more? Oh, yeah. And, and how can a seller determine if they're interviewing agents who's being straight and who's giving them a price just to get their listing? Well, I think it's, you know, you, you want... I think it goes to another part of the conversation where it's like, if, if you're looking at the information and none of it jibes with what you feel the value is, you have to question that. And you have to have someone who's going to have that tough conversation with you because that's but all. Richard, why, why would they tell me my home is worth more? They want to get the listing. What will happen is they're going to get the listing. It's going to sit there. And then they're going to come back and say, we have to adjust it. And they're hoping that they're locked in with you at that point. And it's like, all right, I guess we got to gotta do it. You know, it's like, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not a forthright way of, of doing business. I'd rather have that conversation up front. And maybe talk to the people about what, what, what are the challenges when you list your home too high? You know, it, it, it takes a heavy toll on the seller, it takes a heavy toll on you. What are the challenges in pricing your home too high? Yeah, you, you miss, there's a, there's, a, there's a golden hour in real estate that I feel is like two weeks. Your first two weeks on the market, you're never going to be newer, you're never going to be shinier than you are in that period of time. And so all the marketing, all the energy, all the momentum is, is really flushed into that two weeks. And you wanna maximize that, right? You're gonna have people in there. And so you wanna, the, the, the home is going to sell for the market value. Whether you price it a little under, you price it over, it's going to go to its level. It's just how do you wanna get there? You wanna do it in two weeks or do you wanna do it in six months? You know, and so if we have, my, my feeling is that if we're priced correctly, and we have everything behind it, there's momentum. And if we have that momentum in the negotiation process, we can do like a real estate judo flip and maybe get it a bit higher than what the market was actually dictating for it. But if you go the other way, if you go too high, you lose all the momentum, you're on the ropes, you're gonna end up in a situation where you're probably gonna be dealing with one buyer, 
you have no leverage. Where in the other situation, you're dealing with multiple buyers typically, and you're able to, to really cultivate the best offer. Because it's not always about price. You know, you can, you're trying to get everything equal with the best terms and then make the best decision with the best buyer. And you sort of lose that if you come on too high. Talk about the classic situation that happens where you ask, you sit down with the seller and you ask them, you know, what do you want to sell your home for? And the, the classic seller response is, you're the expert, you tell me. What's, what's the challenge, you know, what's the mistake in doing that for the seller when they, when they don't want to be forthcoming with what they want to sell their home for? What's, it's sort of like you, it sort of ro it robs the, 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 the space for like a really constructive dialogue, right? Cause it's almost, it's almost like a, like a game show, you know? what's my home worth? And I go, 999? And you go, wrong. And it's like, you're out. You know what I mean? Where it's like, you could be, you could be the best agent for the job, like the most skilled, but you just have a differing opinion on price, which is totally understandable. So I think that is always a very difficult way to, to lead into that, you know? And I would probably say that to, to the seller, you know? It feels like a game show. <laughs> if I get it wrong, am I out? Let's talk about home preparation and the importance of home preparation in today's market. And the, the, the challenges in, in speaking to a, a seller, because you know, the way you live in a home is different than the way you sell a home. And, and so how do you introduce the, the concept of staging and, and getting the home ready for market? Um. I, I, I always use that exact phrase. Like there's two ways, there's, 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 there's a way you live in a house and there's a way you sell a house and they are completely different, different animals. And so you're going, it's going to suck for you for a couple of weeks. But if we do everything right, it's gonna be well worth it, you know? Um, and that's it. And it's just really, and, I, and I, I'm just very candid. I say, look, I'm gonna go around. I work with buyers, I work with sellers. And so buyer logic is, I don't want to make a mistake. So most buyers come in, especially first time buyers, and they're like looking, they're looking for problems. What's the problem? Oh, that, that. What's this floor? What's that thing? There's a mark on the wall. And they're kind of looking around. And if they can fill up enough like problems, they go, well, this, I'm not buying this house. This is crazy. And they, they alleviate themselves of the existential crisis of having to go through the process of buying a home. And so I tell sellers, I'm going to walk through and I'm going to look at it like a buyer. That's a problem. That's a problem. That concerns me. What's that about? Questions about this. And we go through and we, you know, we photograph everything and label everything, send it to the client. So they have, they have a very exact checklist of what needs to be done. Uh, and then we help facilitate getting those things prepared. So it's, it's a very candid conversation um, and detail oriented, but we also help them in that process to simplify it. You know, uh, we're here to, to, to make the process easy for them. What's the thing that potential sellers resist most when it comes to preparing the home for sale potentially can cost them a lot of money? Us, I think staging is like so crucial. Um, I, I think that buyer- you don't, like my, you don't like my furniture? You don't like my decorations? Where, where the thing is, they're, you're, they're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we are, we are trying to get, we're trying to appeal to as many people as possible. Like my home is super specific to me. If I was to sell my home, I would probably take my stuff out and stage it personally, you know? Uh, and the reason is, is because everyone, whether they realize it or not, is a, is a marketing genius. They've all been weaned on HGTV. They've all looked at Dwell Magazine. They all get Architectural Digest. They have, a, they have this idea of what their life should look like. Even if they maybe can't afford it, there's this expectation. And so if you're not meeting the expectation, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like you, what we're selling, even in homes that may not be necessarily, uh, you know, Architectural Digest showcase homes, you know, we're selling 
a, a lifestyle. We're selling a, a, a vision, you know, because usually when you're buying, you're coming from someplace up to something else. And there's a vision of what you want it to be. And what we want to do is capture the vision. So when they come in, they're like, yes, this is what I've dreamt of. You know, and then once a, once a buyer in the market is, is sort of more, it becomes more of an emotional conversation than a pricing conversation. And so for sellers, I think everyone resists staging and it's just, it's so important. All right, let's talk marketing. And the dirty little secret in real estate is most every agent does the same thing when it comes to marketing a home. Every agent will walk in with their marketing plan from A to Z. And if a seller were to compare one agent to the next, it's pretty much the same plan. However, what is the difference in marketing between one agent and another? You know, I, I think a lot of it is, um, so like the, like when I market, I have a, it's like I have a certain personality, right? And so I'm able to infuse marketing with sort of a creative vision that I have for the property. Um, I think, you know, you, a lot of people have the same things, you know, but it's how is it, how is it executed? You know, I mean, for us, it's like, you know, if you, if you saw the promotion for the, for our talk today, like, you won't see anything like that out there for something like this, you know? So like I, for a long time, I've done like really strange write-ups for properties. Like, so, and I always use the analogy, it's like, you know, you have this asset, especially in a place like Los Angeles, it's a million to, to $3 million or whatever, the sky's the limit. And so you have this product you want to sell. And so, if you were to take that product to Madison Avenue and walk into an advertising agency and go, Hey, I have this product I want to sell. It costs $2 million. Can you come up with something uh, to help me sell it? You know, and the, and the guys go, yeah, yeah, give us a week. And they come back and they go, okay, we got it. Hardwood floors, updated plumbing, curb appeal, turnkey. You'd be like, you're fired. You're fired. Get out of here. You know, and so we, we've always taken the approach of like doing things differently. You know, like I've, I've, I've do, I've write ups about falling in love and romance. Like I've had the houses that I've sold where I've like, I wrote a rap song for the description, you know, and what happens is, is that we get picked up by all these different outlets that go, that's, that's crazy. That's awesome. And we get all these different eyes on it. Like that's marketing. Like me just telling someone what's here isn't marketing, you know? And so I, I think that it's, it's, you know, that's another reason it's important that, that with the agent you choose, you need someone who is, is going to be creative and think outside of the box, especially in a market like Los Angeles. Let's talk about the importance of an agent's ability to negotiate. So we get the home price, we get the home stage, we get it, we, we get it promoted, buyers start coming in, we get an offer, hopefully maybe multiple offers. Talk about the different level of skill set from one agent to another and what sellers should be looking for. Yeah, so you, I mean, you can't, you have to have someone who's gonna manage that situation. You know, it, it is super delicate. Like everything, everything, every communication is a negotiation. And I think a lot of people miss that, you know, like, from the first time the agent calls you, you know, the buyer's agent will call you. Like I'm already like, I'm already in the negotiation at that point, pre-offer, you know? And so what I'm trying to do is get the value as high as I can get it with the best terms that I can get and get as many of those on the table for my seller. And then at that point, I think the human element comes in, right? Like a lot of times you work with clients or they'll be like, oh, I'm gonna write a great letter. It's like, yeah, a letter, that's great, you know? But I, think, I don't think that comes into play until the, the, the money is right and the terms are right. And then people want to know, well, who do, I, who do I feel connected to, you know? So my job is to weed out people that are going to be problems, you know? Like, and, and all that happens, it's an interesting thing. Like, a lot of times clients don't know that 
their agent is really doing them a disservice because they don't see how an agent is communicating, right? Like sometimes I'll be the listing agent and someone will call me and be like, what's going on in that house? Huh? Like, just like, like really gruff. Or what are you going to do? And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And so like, I make a mental note. Oh, that's so-and-so, you know? And so when that offer comes in, like I'm aware of that, you know? And so if it's on the table, the seller usually asks me, what do you think? You know? And it's like, well, you know, um, so-and-so has been very easy to work with, very communicative. Uh, they've been a little problematic, you know, and so uh, it, it's just a very, uh, you're in a, a pivotal position at that point. So let's switch gears a little bit. Buyers, what value do you think you bring to the table when you're representing a buyer looking to buy a home? Yeah, I mean, you it's always tell clients like I'm probably, I'm probably not going to like find, find your home. You know what I mean? I'm not going to be like, Oh, here's the house. You know, it's like, we're looking at all these different things. Many times a client will be out, we'll be out, you know, together or sometimes not. And they'll go, Oh, I like two, two, three main street. I'm like, okay, great. Let me make some calls. And so once again, from that first phone call, I'm setting up the dynamic that makes them want to do business with me and business with my clients. You know, like there's, there's a way to approach it. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to gather information. I'm trying to get the lay of the land so I can figure out the best pathway forward to get the client, the property. And that's my role to come up with as much information as I can come up with a strategy and explain it to the client. And many times I'll say to clients, I'm like, look, this is how I would do it. We're obviously different people. So my tolerance for risk may be higher than yours, but I think this is the path forward to get the house, you know? So explaining that and, and, you know, there's so much nuance to it, you know, um, you know, in some situations and it's super competitive, you know, you're having to lift contingencies and what does that mean? Uh, really, really clarifying and simplifying the, the process of it to the buyer. Uh, is super important. I've, I've worked with people who bought homes before and they've, they've worked with me now and they're like, and they'll, I'll be explaining something to them like, Ooh, what's that? And it's like, Oh, well that's this. And they're like, what, what is that? And I'm like, Oh, that's standard. And like, I never knew that, you know? And so my, my goal is to get in the house, get them through the process as simply and clearly as possible, hopefully educate them through that process. So when they're oh, when it's over, you know, they're, they want to do more real estate in the future with us or, you know, feel comfortable, you know, referring us to their, you know, family and friends. So this will sound a little self-serving in some ways. Let's talk about two different situations with buyers. The buyer who wants to work with multiple agents and not commit to any one agent. What are the pros and cons of that? And then the buyer who thinks I'm going to get a better deal if I go directly to the listing agent. How would you, how would you respond to each of those scenarios? Well, I mean, if, if you work with everybody, you work with nobody, you know, nobody's working for you, you know? So it's, you, you, you won't, it's just, it's like you're, you're cutting, you're, you're, you know, cutting off your nose in spite of your face. Like, you don't, you don't have anyone working for you because trust me, if they, if you become aware that someone else is, is working with multiple people, you're, you know, they're not going to be inclined to really put in the effort it takes to get your house, you know? Uh, I think having a relationship with an agent is like, you I mean, obviously I'm, I'm an agent, so, uh, but I think it's really important, you know, like you, like what, it, 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 there's a low barrier of entry to become a real estate agent. If you can pass a standardized test, you can get a license. But getting a license and building a successful business are, are just vastly different things. You know, like you, my my business is built on relationship most of most of the transactions that we conduct each year uh, probably half of them come from either repeat business or referral business you know and that says a lot about how we do what we do you know and so when when clients come to us you know we are when they want to do something like we're pulling out all these stops to make it happen you know and there's a lot of like off you know, behind the scenes and daily practice and training to, to get our skills up and to keep sharpening them that, you know, I, I don't think you're going to find if you're just sort of playing the field. And I think for, you know, for, for sellers, um, 
you know, it, it, it's the same thing. We, we, we have to, uh, we stay sharp and, and, and make sure that they win. It's all about them winning. And what about the buyer who wants to go directly to a listing agent? Your thoughts on that one? I'm sure you get approached by buyers. Oh, yeah, all the time. All the time. Hey, we, we, we want to work with you, you know? And it's just a, it's a bad idea, you know? Because it's like you don't have anyone representing you. Like I, how am I, how am I a neutral third party if I know what everybody wants, you know, it's just, and, and I think a lot of times people think, oh, if I go direct to the listing agent, I'm going to get a deal, you know, and it's like the buy, the seller wants, the seller wants, they always say seller wants as much money as they can get as quickly as they can get it with as little headaches and hassles as possible, you know. And so if you're going to, if you're going to step up and try to take a property off the market, you know, you're, it has to be extraordinary an extraordinary, you know, and most people aren't up for that. And then, you know, you, you really don't, you want so you want an ally, you want someone on your side, you want someone that's going to fight for you. You want someone that's going to clarify the process for you. So, so you can get to the other side of it successfully, but also, you know, with good, you know, trusting that the process was, was good. What do you think the biggest misconception is about what you do as a real estate agent? I think, I, well, I think just that it's, it's, it's easy. It might be easy. The perception is that it could be easy, you know, because you, you know, you, if I'm with, let's say I'm with a buyer and they want to buy a house and we start, putting it together, we put the deal together, I'm negotiating it, and all of a sudden they get the house, it's like, it can, it can feel like, oh, I got the house because I just paid the most money and I got the house, you know, um, which is not, it's rarely the, the case, you know. Um, there's so much happening uh, on so many different levels all the time, you know, from like, I always, I always tell my team, we're, we're masters of the art of the elegant push. You know, we have to like, there's so many players in the game and everyone has very, no one is, is, is motivated in the deal as much as my client and I am. And so I'm constantly having to bring people's level of motivation up, uh, you know, to get on our time schedule. Uh, but you don't want to do that. You have to do that in a way that makes people feel it's their idea and uh, they want to be part of your team too. So um yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a big part of it. You've been doing real estate how long now? Um, almost 13 years. And what, what's the biggest change you've seen in the business from day one to where you are today? Well, when I got into the business, it was all short sales, REOs and for, I mean, REOs foreclosures, you know, and that was a completely different animal. You know, the whole, the whole industry had to shift at that point because of the, you know, the, the glut of, of uh, foreclosures and short sales were coming on the market and then seeing the market then turn to, uh, to a seller's market and seeing the competition. Uh, it's just constantly having to like readjust, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's a whole different, there's a whole different language and approach when you're dealing with foreclosures and short sales and, a, and the process is different. And then once you switch over and you're in a seller's market and it's a competitor for buyers, like that's a different animal too. So you're, you're, you're constantly just having to be, you can't rest on your laurels. You can't think, and I think that's a, that you can't, I think a lot of times with agents, there's just like kind of, there's a little, there can be like a lot of bravado there. Like I'm number one, number one, number one, you know, I'm number one. And you know, and it's like, I don't think you can rest on your laurels. You have to constantly be learning and training and looking around and, 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 and just getting better all the time. I think that's, you know, that, that's the thing that I've, that the market has completely shifted uh, and having to adapt to that. And that was very, it's, it's been a very interesting process. So that leads into, you talk about getting better all the time. Why do you hire a real estate coach? What, what, what does that do for you? Well, it keeps you, I mean, first off, it keeps you accountable, you know, like you, you, uh, you and I talk every Thursday, you know, um, there's things that, that, you know, everybody, if you're, you know, 
exactly. As a real estate agent, you, you are, you're an entrepreneur, you know, you're on the front line of like, you know, entrepreneurial endeavors, you know? And so I have staff and other agents and, you know, uh, that I'm kind of, that I'm working with as well. And so, um, I want to, it's a weird thing. Like real estate is like, it's, it's a profession, but I look at it as sort of this like platform for growth, you know, like I've, I've, I've had to learn so much in the last 13 years. I've been, I'm constantly confronted by things I don't know that I have to learn things I'm afraid of. You know, like having like to go, oh, okay, well, I have to have this very difficult conversation. How do I do that? You know, I don't want to do that, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's, it's about just constantly getting better. Like I want to, I want to master, it's impossible to master it, but I want to become really, really proficient at what I do for being proficient at what I do, but also for the process of what it takes for me personally to become really proficient, you know, which is constantly having to let go of things that may not be um, productive and, and learning new habits and learning new skills. And, you know, it's, I think I, I learned probably later in life that it's like, you know, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to try to be the best at it. You know, whether it's, whether it's like, you know, if I'm, if I'm sweet, if I'm mopping the floor in the kitchen, it's like, I'm going to do it really, really well. You know, like I just want to be, I want to be great at what I do. You have a big sense of humor. How do you bring that into your real estate business? Um, I, I can't help it. <laughs> it's not like, it's not anything that I'm like, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to say something funny here. You know, it's just, it's a, it's innately who I am, you know, like, um, I just see, I've always seen things in a very strange way. And I've, you know, I feel like it's, it's a risk sometimes to say something that's like off in a, in a situation. But I found just as like, it's been a great skill because it like kind of decompresses a situation and everyone can loosen up and start to really sort of communicate and get comfortable because everyone kind of comes into these things like, um, kind of the, you know, like, I'm the buyer, they're the seller, and we've got different goals. And, you know, it's a, it, can be, it can be very combative, you know, and there's a lot of intensity around it. So, you know, it's sometimes just like cracking a, a joke at like a, at a, at an event. I was at an inspection recently and the inspector said, um, he was pointing out some stuff and the buyer goes, what, are, what kind of floors are these? And he's like, uh, oh, they're hickory. And he goes, oh, I'm like, that's why the house smells like bacon. And you're, everyone just kind of stopped and like, I'm like, I'm, like I'm, I'm kidding. And they're like, oh, God, I didn't smell the bacon. I'm like, I was just joking. So like everyone kind of like, ah, like just relaxes a little bit. And like we can start to like really have conversation and, and, and get to the bottom of what's going on. So, yeah, I do it all the time. And a lot of, and a lot of, a lot of my clients are really funny, which is great. You know, I, a lot of times I have like actors and who are uh, who are my clients and you know, like we just, we end up like just improv like we're driving around in a car and we're just like saying, create, we're having crazy long improv sessions while we look at property, you know? And um, yeah, that's just, it's just kind of, it's just who I, it's who I am. It doesn't, it's not anything I, I put on or anything I'm trying to do. It's just how I see the world. And, you know, it makes me, it, it, when I, when people can relax and we can all sort of like, we can get to really good stuff. So if anyone has any questions or Lauren, if anyone uh, had a chat, you want to take a few minutes to answer those? Yeah. So I have a good question here about, so Richard, what are your immediate steps in representing a buyer who hasn't found a home yet? What are the first steps you take? Um, I, well, you know, I, and I've, I've been around a lot of coaching and there's certain, you know, people like don't ever like, don't ever show anyone or do anything for a buyer who's not qualified, you know? And like, I just, I'm, I'm a relationship person, you know? So when I meet someone like, um, they, like most people don't 
have a, a pre-approval or a pre-qualification when you meet them. It's really rare, like that someone shows up like, here's my, here's my pre-approval, let's go, you know? And so um, I, I wanna help them do that, but also I wanna help them like, okay, what, what's the house you want? Like, do you have a sense of what maybe you can afford? I wanna get them engaged in, in the process of looking for homes. So the first thing I do is like, you know, talk to them, you know, obviously I talk to them about the importance of getting their pre-approval and, and finding out, you know, what kind of, how much house they can buy, and what they're comfortable buying. Um, and then connect them with a mortgage broker if they don't have one. Uh, and then we talk about what kind of house they want and then what the process is going to look like. You know, this is how we're going to set it up. And this is where you're going to get information from me and, and really um, give them a, a sense of that process, um, you know, out of the gate. Like my, my role is to really, I want to short circuit the process, you know, and so I try to get them up to speed on the market as quickly as possible. Uh, get their approval ready. And, and so they're ready. And I always tell clients, I'm like, look, what I want to do right now is get you ready. And I said, I've never, you know, and I and always, it, it's, uh, I've probably been in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of buyer meetings. And I've never been in a buyer meeting or spoken with a buyer who always says, we're not in a hurry. You know, because they, they feel like I have like some sort of weird magical like realtor power and I'm going to like make them buy a house. Um, but I always say, look, you know, your process is your process. We're going to support it. We're here for as long as it takes two months, two years, whatever it is. Uh, I just want you to be ready because what typically happens is people aren't ready and then they're out on brunch one Sunday and they finish and they're like, look, they see open house sign. And then I get like a frantic phone call being like, oh my God, we found the house. And I'm like, oh great. Did you get pre-approved? And they're like, oh, no, we haven't done that yet. And so all of a sudden it's like, a, a, a process that has a little that, that pressure to it is now even amped up more because now they got to get a pre-approval or if they're doing gift funds now they got to have that conversation and so they're expending all this energy getting ready to get ready you know and i'd say just let's just get ready on the front end so when we do see that house uh, we can put all of our energy into getting the house anything else lauren I think we're good. I think you guys um, basically covered pretty much everything. Yeah. Richard, always a pleasure. Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And guys, thank whoever's here. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, next week, uh, our next week's guest is, is, couldn't be more apropos in our current situation. Her name is Susie North. Uh, she has a degree in early childhood education from UC Berkeley. She's a master teacher. She's been trained in mediation and facilitation with the LA City Attorney's Office. Um, she just recently wrote a book called The Opposite of Combat, A Parent's Guide to Teaching Siblings How to Collaborate and Solve Their Own Conflicts. Susie was also once hit on by a young Dustin Hoffman. True story. Uh, and she's going to be on the call next week, and she's going to talk to us about how to make our kids uh, conflict competent and handle their own issues. So it should be a cool call. Steve, thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. And thanks again for everybody for joining in the call. Thank you.